Hey guys, welcome to another video. Today we're going to be going through the first part of Wave's light and sound, strictly looking at Wave properties. So, if we're going to be taking a look at this uh, subsection of the syllabus, so have a look at that and we'll begin the video. Uh, so, Waves, what is it? It's basically the transfer of energy from one place to another without actually the transfer of the particles themselves in the medium. The particles uh, just sort of vibrate in its fixed positions and that allows the transfer of the energy to take place. But the particles themselves are not moving from, you know, let's just say you had a particle here. Um, the particles themselves are not moving from A to B. It's just particles in a succession, they are going to be going up and down or oscillating uh, in its fixed positions. Now this is the case for a transverse wave, but you can also have particles that uh, sort of move side waves in a longitudinal wave. And we'll go through the differences in a second here. But uh, here is an example of a transverse wave where you've got your rope hooked onto a tree and you're sort of just, uh, you know, raising the movement up and down. That leads to these molecules of the rope in different positions uh, sort of moving in its fixed positions up and down. And you can see that the up and down movement of the molecules is actually sort of 90 degrees to the direction of the wave itself. The wave itself, if you take a look at the midline, is going in this particular direction, but the oscillation or the movement of the particles about its fixed position is sort of going up and down. And you see that there's this 90 degree angle, and that's a transverse wave. However, if you think about a spring that's attached onto the wall here, and you are, you know, moving the spring on a, on a left to right basis, you know, some parts are going to be compressed and some parts are going to be, you know, further apart. But of course, the oscillation is there. So you'll get this movement of a compression and separation, compression and separation. This is an example of a longitudinal wave. And it's different from a transverse wave because the movement of the particles in its fixed position or the oscillation is in the same direction as the actual direction of the movement of the wave. And that's a longitudinal example. Um, but here you can see if you shake the spring up and down, then this time the positions of the particles are going up and down about its oscillation, which is at 90 degrees to the movement of the wave. And that 90 degree angle suggests that it's a transverse wave. So key differences there. Um, so we've talked about this already, but longitudinal waves have particles that vibrate in a parallel or same direction to the wave. You have compressions where you have particles that are fairly close by together and you've got reaffections, which is when the particles are most spread out apart. And sound is an example of a longitudinal wave. Transverse waves have particles that are in perpendicular directions uh, to vibrate in perpendicular directions to the wave direction. And so if you take a look at a transverse wave, what you'll find is that you'll have parts of the oscillation pattern where the particles are furthest away from its rest position and you'll uh, well, you know highest away from its rest position and you'll also have particles that are at its lowest point from its rest position which is this baseline horizontal line there and so we call this top or most highest position a crest and we call the most bottom bit or the lowest point a trough and you can see that Along the wave, you have multiple crests that occur in a uh, fixed period, and you've got a trough or troughs that occur as uh, the wave moves along its direction of travel. Now, the amplitude is the maximum distance uh, from the from the uh, baseline or from the rest position to the highest point or you could say the lowest point of the 
wave. So in other words, the distance between the rest position and the crest or the dif distance between the rest position and a trough is going to be the amplitude of the wave. And you know, those distances will always be the same. If you calculate the distance between this crest and this rest position, that will be the same as the distance between this rest position and this trough, which will always also be the same distance between this rest position and this crest, etc. So these waves happen at a very uh, sort of at a very regular sort of a pattern, and the difference between this point here and this point here that's the that's one cycle, okay, where the wave goes up, down, passes the trough, and then goes back to rest position, okay. So important things that we've talked about uh you know we've we know what a crest is we know what a trough is um we know what the amplitude is so let's just go through a few more of these things the wavelength is actually the distance between adjacent particles that are at the same point in their vibration as i said the crest doesn't happen once but it occurs you know multiple times as long as the wave is in constant motion uh the crest will always occur at regular intervals and so will the trough because the wave and the transverse wave at least will always have this up and down movement of the wave and so the difference or the distance between one crest to another remember these two points are in the same um, at same points or in their vibration, they're at its highest peak, uh, the difference between these two in terms of its distance is called the wavelength. Now, you don't always have to calculate from um, crest to crest. Any two points that are exactly in the same vibration status is going to, that's going to be a wavelength. For example, this one here is in rest position um, and you've got uh, this one here in, in rest position and so between one cycle that can also be a wavelength which is actually this symbol here and you could also go from trough to trough if you go one trough here another trough here calculate the distance that is the wavelength okay so you can see how important wavelength is now that's easy to replicate so that's easy to see on a transverse wave like this but in a longitudinal wave um, it's really just the distance between two adjacent compressions or rarefactions, which is sort of the same concept of two parts of the wave being in its same vibration pattern. So you can see here uh, on, on a longitudinal wave that this is sort of where the particles are most compressed. So this is considered uh, one part or a compression. And you're going to find when that compression happens next, which is here. That's compression. And so the difference between these two lengths is the wavelength. And same thing for a tr for for a rearfection, which is the most separated part, which is here. We've got one rearfection here, another rearfection here. Calculate the distance again. That's the wavelength. The amplitude is the maximum distance or maximum displacement of particles from its rest position. So in a transverse wave, it's literally just the distance between the rest position to the peak. Uh, but again, um, the actual amplitude can also be calculated between the distance between the rest point and a trough as well, because the trough and the crest will have same uh, distances away from rest position. And the velocity of the wave, uh, just like normal velocity where we take into account distance divided by time, is really just the distance traveled by the wave per second, and just like normal velocity is measured in meters per second. Now, the frequency of the wave is the number of complete waves passing a point per second. It's measured in hertz. And so, you've got one cycle here, right? This is getting a bit messy, so I'll redo it. So you've got one cycle, one full cycle, right here, from this point to this point, okay? Now, how many cycles of these waves are passing a certain point per second? Uh, now, that is what frequency is, and the formula goes, velocity of a wave is equal to frequency times wavelength. 
Wavelength is a measure in meters, frequency in hertz, velocity in meters per second. So, so basically, if you wanted to rearrange the formula and figure out the frequency of a certain wave, then it would be simply the speed or the velocity of the wave, and you divide that by its wavelength. And the last term, wavefronts, is basically the location of all particles of a medium in its same state of vibration. So it's perpendicular to the wave direction, um, and the distance between one wavefront to the next is the wavelength. So it's a very similar concept to just where the vibration points are the same between two crests or two troughs or whatever it may be. So when it comes to waves, there's certain things that uh, we need to be aware of, its properties, in terms of reflection, refraction, and diffraction of waves. Reflection, as you might expect, is simply when waves, as it hits a plane surface, it will become reflected off that surface. Now, when a wave becomes reflected, none of the frequency, speed, or the wavelength, or anything changes. It stays exactly the same. So what it means is when a wave is reflected off a surface, uh, nothing changes except for the direction of the wave because of course it's getting reflected off and bounced off the surface and you can use a ripple tank which is basically like a big water tank that you can create ripples out of and these ripples represent the um, wave front of the wave like so and you can sort of see how these waves start to behave when it bounces off a surface so here is an example of something that we might see where you've got the initial water wave that you're creating with the ripple tank and you purposely place like a, a surface here just to see what happens when it reflects and when it becomes reflected you can see the direction sort of bounces off but none of the wavelengths or speed or you know the original properties of the wave itself is going to change as a result of that reflection. Refraction on the other hand is a little bit different. It's when speed of light changes as it travels from one medium to another medium of a different density. Density is key here. When light travels through one object of density A and it travels to another object of density B Depending on the densities, the light will travel at a different speed within the two mediums. And you can see that effect being uh, translated here in this diagram. Again, we're using a ripple tank and we're just creating a few ripples uh, using a vibration tool. And you can see how originally in deep water, the wave fronts of the original wave look like this, but in shallow water, clearly the direction changes and also the wavelength, which is the distance between the two wave fronts, the wavelength has actually shrunk. Right? You can see that uh, the property of the wave is actually different from the original property. And the reason for that is because water actually travels more slowly in shallow water compared to deep water. Okay, so that because the density of deep water is different from the density of shallow water, the speed at which the wave travels through these two mediums is actually different. And as a result of that difference, you can see that the properties of the waves actually change. Not only does the direction change, but the speed changes, and with that, also the wavelength changes as well. So there's a lot of changes that go into that. We will be looking at refraction in a bit more detail when it comes to the topic of light. But, you know, for this example, just see how the, the, uh, the, the fact that different uh, mediums in which a wave is traveling in can affect the property of the wave as a result of refraction, which is when the speed changes from one medium to another. Now, diffraction is the spreading out of waves when it passes through either a narrow gap or across the edge of an object. We'll go through both examples here. So for example, you've got this uh, little gap here and you've got the original wave coming through and as it passes that gap, you'll notice that it starts to spread out. Um, and the extent of how much the wave spreads out like this is dependent on how big the gap is compared to the wavelength. And so basically, you know, the, the more smaller the gap is compared to the wavelength, the more spreading out it will become. And, and or, or you could also say the longer the wavelength, um, the the greater the diffraction becomes. So the, the more the difference there is between the wavelength and the size of the gap, 
uh, then the more diffraction will occur as a result of that. Uh, so you'll find that if you have like a really large wavelength and a really large gap, for example, then the diffraction effect wouldn't be as large. Uh, but the diffraction doesn't happen just with holes or gaps. You can actually get diffraction occurring at the edge of a barrier. So you've got uh, the waves just cruising along and then it hits this edge here. Uh, what you'll find is, again, there's a bit of spreading out that occurs as a result of that barrier. So that's diffraction. So I hope that made sense guys, thank you very much for watching, free ex resources on freeexamacademy.com where I place and uh, write my notes and things like that for IGCSE topics and patreon.com where I go through past paper videos and things of that nature. I've got a lot for biology and chemistry at the moment, I'm still working on more physics, I don't have a lot there but that's mainly because I want to finish up this YouTube stuff uh, course here on YouTube first before I go ahead with going through some past paper questions uh, to, to solve with you guys on a topic wise basis so uh, it can be quite helpful um, so I suggest that you check that out um, for those that you that want to just sort of uh, get higher grades and uh, take your learning to the next level but thank you very much and I will see you in the next video